Hello, Calculus Kids, this is Mr. Bean, and in today's lesson, we're going to talk about how to find the concavity of a function over an interval. And before we can figure that out, you have to know what concavity means. So I looked up a quick definition, and it said, the state or quality of being concave. And I really hate it when the definition of a word uses the word inside that, so inside the definition. So let me just see if I can just make this very clear. Concave, if you think about how you have contacts that you'll put in your eye and it has a certain concavity to it, concave up would mean that it would look like this. Concave down would be something that looks like that, where it's, it's opening down, or in this case, opening up. So that's concave up. If you had a straight line going across here like this, okay, I can't draw a very straight line. If it, if it was a completely straight line, it would have no concavity. It would not be concave up or concave down. But if I could take this thing, pinch it, and then drag it down, then it would be concave up. I like, if I was in class, I would take a rubber band and I would just show you. I'd take a rubber band and pull it down and show that it's concave up, or I'd grab the rubber band and pull it up and show that it was concave down, because then you could see it like that. Okay, so. If you have a function like a parabola that's concave up, so here we have, this is actually x squared, y equals x squared. If it's concave up, what is f prime doing? Now what's f prime? f prime is the slope of the tangent at a specific point. So let's think about a tangent line. Just to, let's do a quick little segment of the tangent line right there. This tangent is negative. Let's draw one over here. The tangent there is negative. Right here, the tangent is still negative, but not quite as negative as these. And then we get here to the bottom and we have a horizontal tangent line, so slope is zero. F prime would be zero. And now F prime is positive, F prime is more positive, and F prime is more positive. It's going increasing, increasing. So what is F prime doing along this? It's going from negative, and it is starting to increase, increase, it gets to zero, then it continues increasing and goes positive, 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 positive. All right, so that leads us to this here, where we can say that if F is concave up, then F prime is increasing. And if f is concave down, then f prime is decreasing. So again, the slope is getting bigger. That's what's happening if something is concave up. So just like what we just showed, if you move along the function, if you have something that's concave up, if you move along the function, the slope is increasing. And same thing if it's concave down, the slope would be going decreasing, getting more and more negative as you move to the right. Okay, so then that also leads us to the following, because if f prime is increasing, what we've learned that if something is increasing, then that something's derivative would have to be positive. So if f prime is increasing, then f double prime is positive. Or if f prime is decreasing, then we know that f double prime would have to be negative. It's less than zero. So now we can say that if the second derivative is positive, then that means that f is concave up. And if the second derivative is negative, that means that f is concave down. These two statements right here is the point of the lesson that we're talking about today. To be able to take the first derivative and then the second derivative and be able to tell if it's concave up or concave down. We're going to use this actually quite a bit in the next few lessons to help us understand the shapes of graphs and what is happening with the graph. So here's a basic parent function of a sinusoid. This is just sine x. And what I wanted to do with this is just write down very quickly when the graph is concave up. So the, it's right here, it's concave up. So I'm gonna write that f second derivative is positive right here. I know it's concave up. And then right here, it's gonna be facing down. So I'm going to say that the second derivative is less than zero. I know right in this area, it's second derivative must be negative. And then again here, second derivative has to be positive for this area, and then here it's concave down, so I know that the second derivative is less than zero. Now I'm gonna come back to this graph in a minute, but that's just the general shape of concavity. So what if we don't have a graph and all we have is the function? So what we'll do for this, uh, we're going to take the second derivative. First, we need the first derivative. So write small here. I know I didn't give you tons of room, so write pretty small. The first derivative is going to equal, four comes down, x cubed minus 12x plus one, right? Minus 12x plus one, and then the minus three is gone. All right, so now we need the second derivative because what we're trying to do is figure out if the second derivative is positive or negative. So this is three x squared minus 12. 
So in order to know what the first derivative, excuse me, what the second derivative is when it's positive or negative, we must know when this thing is equal to zero. So I'm gonna take the second derivative and set it equal to zero. And then when I solve, I'm gonna get x squared equals, add 12 divided by three, four. So x is going to equal plus or minus two. Now this is, these two points are where the second derivative is zero. So we're gonna go back to making a chart. Remember when we did this with the first derivative? Uh, that was really sloppy. Let me try that line again. There, that's better. So we take now, instead of writing down the first derivative on this table, we're gonna say the second derivative of f of x. And the interval is going to be from negative infinity up to negative two, close my parenthesis, and then I'm gonna go at negative two. I already know at negative two, the second derivative is zero. And then I'm gonna go from negative two to two. And then at the number two, the second derivative is zero. And then I'm gonna go from two to infinity. Okay, uh, I made my table too big. Let's erase part of this here. That's way, plenty large enough. Okay, so the next thing is we need a test point in between negative infinity and negative two. And the test point, again, we're looking at the sign of the second derivative. So we're looking here at this line. 3x squared minus 12. We're just trying to figure out positive or negative. We don't care to know exactly the number, just is it positive or is it negative? So let's plug in a really big negative number, closer to negative infinity. So really big number, but then it's being squared, so that makes it positive, minus 12. This is positive, so I'm just gonna put a little plus sign. You could write POS for positive or whatever. I'm just gonna put plus. And then here we'll do a zero, because negative two to two, number inside that interval, test value would be zero, zero, minus 12, that one's negative. And then two to infinity, we're gonna get a really big number again, squared minus 12, so that one's positive. What this tells us is that if the second derivative is positive, then f, the function, is concave up. And if the second derivative is negative, it's concave down, and if it's positive, it's concave up. Why? Because if it's positive, it's happy people. And if it's negative, those are sad people. It's negative, concave down, that's just bummer. Okay, so now, what do we do with that? We have to now write out a justification. Now leave yourself some room over here because I'm gonna write something here later. So what we're, we try to find the intervals of concavity. So let's say concave up on, and then I'm gonna say on the intervals, negative infinity to negative two, and what was the other one? Two to infinity. But now we have to say why. And we're gonna say because, it's concave up because the second derivative is positive, it's greater than zero. Or if we didn't know anything about the second derivative, but we knew that the first derivative was increasing, we could say that as a justification too. We could say because f prime is increasing, but this means the same thing. The second derivative is positive and it's faster. Okay, so then the, the next thing we wanna write is when is it concave down? And we say that happens on the interval, just this interval right here from negative two to two, but we have to write the reason and that is because f double prime f prime prime is less than zero. That's our justification statement. This shows us that we understand concavity is coming from the second derivative's sign, positive or negative. Next up, we're gonna talk about point of inflection. Um, this has a lot of uses. There's a lot of times this comes up in economics too. But for today, we're gonna focus just on the graph where a point of inflection is on a graph. So a point of inflection of f is at x equals c if, this is the confusing math stuff, if f of c is defined and the second derivative of f changes signs at x equals c. Okay, what is that? Well, in other words, a point of inflection is where the graph changes concavity. When the graph changes from positive to negative, from concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up. Okay, that's all we're talking about here. So when we have something that changes, right there we have a point of inflection. So what I'm gonna do is let's go back. So I'll write down the changes concavity thing, and let's go back to our graph here, and we're gonna label some points of inflection. So in between, here it's concave up, and somewhere right around here is where it changes. And then it's concave down, concave down, and then somewhere it's changing and is no longer concave down. Now it is concave up. And then again, it changes here, and then it would change there, and so forth. So these dots that I'm putting on here, these represent points of inflection. And let's draw an arrow. So that's a point of inflection, that's a point of inflection, and yes, all the other ones are as well. But these are, the, these are points of inflection, where the concavity changes. So that's how you look at it on a graph. It's kind of hard to know exactly where it is if you don't have the function itself, or the, excuse me, the, the equation to work with. 
But how about if you had the table with all the numbers? So here are the point of inflection. So let's write this down right here. Points of inflection, uh, and I'm gonna abbreviate right there. Points of inflection at x equals, now where does this happen? It happens where the second derivative is changing signs. So here it went from positive to negative, and then from negative to positive. So it's happening at x equals negative two and x equals two. And now we say the reason why. Because, I'm gonna abbreviate here, because f double prime, so f prime prime changes sign. So when f double prime changes sign, that's how we know if we have a point of inflection. It's not because the first, excuse me, because the second derivative was zero. The second derivative actually might not exist and it could still be a point of inflection. Okay, so let's get to that. Here's our justification. So we have justification for concave up, concave down, and then we have a justification for if it's a point of inflection because the second derivative changed signs. So let's talk about the mistakes. First mistake students make is that they assume that if the second derivative equals zero, that means there is a point of inflection. It does not mean there's a point of inflection. It means if the second derivative equals zero, it means it's a candidate, that there might be a point of inflection. So don't always assume it is. You have to be careful and double check that the sign is changing around this. Just like when we did mins and maxes with the first derivative, it's the same type of idea. You have to check that it changes signs. Also, if you see that the second derivative does not exist, Students think, oh, okay, well, there's no point of inflection there. That's not true either. There might be a point of inflection. Let me show, you, draw you a quick little example. Maybe off on the left, you could put this in your notes there. Um, if I had a function that was concave up like this, it's going up, 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 and then all of a sudden it changes and is concave down like that. So we have some type of graph that's really weird graph that looks like this. This is a point of the graph where the first derivative does not exist. And if the first derivative, because it's a corner, if the first derivative doesn't exist, neither does the second. But that is still a point of inflection. Isn't that weird? It's a point of inflection, but it's not nice and smooth, but the concavity changed. We went concave up, and then all of a sudden it changed and went concave down. So it is considered a point of inflection. So just because the second derivative doesn't exist does not mean you cancel it out. You still have to check concavity changing. The only thing you have to be careful about though is that you verify that that point that you're working with, if the second derivative doesn't exist, does the function even exist, okay? F of C has to be defined. So we're at that point of the point of inflection, it must, you have to actually be able to plug it into the original function or else it, obviously it can't be anything. It's not part of the function. Okay, now on to graphs, let's do this. This is very common type of things that you'll see on an AP exam where you have these F prime graphs or F double prime graph. Okay, so I'm giving you an example, one of each. What we're trying to do here with F prime is figure out when is F concave up, concave down, and what are the points of inflection? Since we're only working with f, excuse me, f prime, uh, let's say f prime decreasing. If f prime is decreasing, then what that tells us is that it is concave down, right? f would be concave down. That's what f prime decreasing is. So here's f prime. This is decreasing. This f prime is going down, 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 down. Here, f prime is going down, 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 down. Okay, so if f prime's slope is negative, f prime is decreasing. So let's say that we have concave down. So let's write the interval where it is concave down. So it starts here, it's open circle at negative four. So we're just gonna say from negative four up until it's decreasing, 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 decreasing until there. So until negative one. And then it is also decreasing from one to two. So we're also gonna say from one to two. These are the intervals where it's concave down. All right, how about concave up? Oh, and why? We're not gonna write a justification right here on this, this uh, graph, but just as a reminder, it's concave down because F prime is decreasing. And if F prime is decreasing, that's the same thing as saying that the second derivative is less than zero. These mean exactly the same thing. All right, concave up. So that's when F prime is going up. So that happens from negative one to one. And then where else is F prime going up? F prime is going up from two to three. So there's our intervals of concavity. And then we just have to list are points of inflection. Inflection, I'm going to abbreviate, inflection. And that happens at x equals, okay, so now it's where does it change concavity? Right here we have negative second derivative, and here we have positive second derivative. So therefore, this is a point of inflection. So that happens at x equals negative one. We also have one at right here because it's going from positive to negative. So that happens at x equals one. And then again here at x equals two. So there's our points of inflection at those x values. So that's f prime. Now you have to change your thinking. We were dealing with f prime. Now we're dealing with f prime prime. 
second derivative. And for it to be concave down, we just need the second derivative to be less than zero. That tells us concave down. So let's write this first, concave down on what intervals? When is second derivative negative? So think about this, this x-axis, that's your boundary line. So it's just when is the second derivative underneath this line? It's from here down to up to here. So that happens from one, negative three to one. That's when it's concave down, negative three to one, because that's when the second derivative is negative. And then it happens again here at three and then on. So it happens from three to infinity. So those are the intervals where it's concave down. And then hopefully you can then see what concave up is. And that's when it's above the x-axis. So that happens from negative infinity up until we get to that point of negative three. And then from this little piece here, it's above the x-axis from one to three. And now points of inflection. Point of inflection is gonna happen where second derivative changes signs. So that's here where it crosses the x-axis. So at x equals negative three, and it has to actually cross. It can't just bounce off the x-axis, it has to cross it. So here it's crossing it, and then there it's crossing it. So at one and three as well. All right, so now you know how to be able to read the graphs of f prime and f prime prime, f the second derivative. Last thing we have to cover, and that is we're gonna revisit what we talked about in 4.6. Do you remember when we had a concave up function and then we would take some type of tangent line, so at a point, and then we would draw a tangent line and we'd use the tangent line to estimate, like we'd be really close and you'd say, okay, this is just an estimate of the function, but that would be an underestimate, right? Underestimate, I'm being sloppy, underestimate. And then if it was concave down, the tangent line would give us an overestimate for some point that was off on the line, but not right on the graph. So that would be an overestimate, right? You remember doing this in, back in 4.6? So now that we can, we can figure out the concavity of a function by ourselves. We don't need to say in the problem because all we need is the second derivative. So let's take the first derivative to start us off. This is product rule. I have my x times my e to the negative x. So I gotta use product rule. So let me do that real quick. And there's my first derivative. I took it with the product rule and then I just cleaned it up and simplified it here to this. So now I need the second derivative. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this off. The second derivative is going to equal the derivative of this is e to the negative x times negative one because of the chain rule, right? And then I'm gonna say minus, open a parenthesis bracket thing. And now I have to take the derivative of this. Well, the derivative of this, I just did it. See, x e to the negative x, it's just this line right here. So I'm gonna write that out real quick. So I've got that derivative now here. So this whole thing is the second derivative. And all I need to know is the second derivative, if the second derivative is positive or negative when x equals one, because then that tells me if it's concave up or concave down, and I'll know if the tangent line is above or below. So let's figure this out real quick here. Let's plug in the number. Well, let's figure this out. So here this negative one is gonna make this negative e to the negative one minus, I'm gonna open my parentheses here, I have e to the negative one minus one times e to the negative one. And that whole thing cancels. That's just zero, right? e to the negative one minus e to the negative one. So that's just zero. So I have negative e to the negative one. Well, that's just negative one over e, but I don't care exactly what the number is. I just care if it's positive or negative and that's less than zero. So my answer to this problem, does the tangent line, is the line tangent of the graph at x equals one lie above or below? So remember if it's, if this is less than zero, then I have this situation here, it's concave down. So we're gonna say the tangent line is above the function, above because, and now what, why, what is my reason? Because the second derivative evaluated at the number one is negative. Okay, that's my answer with my justification. So now you can tell if the tangent line's above or below, just if it's an overestimate or an underestimate, just based on figuring out the concavity yourself. Okay, we've covered it all. I know that was a bit long, sorry about that, but it was really important stuff in this lesson. So rock that master check, and I'll see you back in the next lesson where we will use this second derivative for more stuff.